Four years ago, I asked Ricardo de Kinsey for a review copy of his book, The Uniqueness of Western Civilization. I let him down. I never published a review. The first 150 pages were really a rather tough slog. He rebutted everybody who had written for the past hundred years to put down the uniqueness of Western civilization, to say there was nothing special about us, that we had stolen our best ideas from elsewhere in the world, and we hadn't really created anything. I thought that was so nonsensical that I wasn't even interested. I had read some of the authors, and I thought they were full of nonsense. I later went on, just this year, to reread the rest of the book, and I found a lot of great substance in it. So let me tell you about us. We are unique. Our ancestors came from the great steppes that stretch from Ukraine to China, and they have some special characteristics. On these great steppes, they weren't able to farm because the land wasn't rich enough to support growing things. And besides that, there was no protection. It was just an endless grassland. No mountains, nothing to hide behind. It wasn't until they tamed horses that they could use it. They tamed horses first for food along the fringes of the forest on the edge of the steppe land. And then later they learned how to ride the horses. This gave them a great advantage. They could ride the horses and tend other horses and soon cattle and sheep and other animals for food. This was a large advantage. But they still had to go back home at night. Then these people invented the wheel. They invented wagons. So they were real nomads because they could take their homes with them and follow the herds. This resulted in a great deal of wealth. Having a lot of food was extremely valuable. Another thing came with having this lot of food. This food had feet. It was easy to steal. So they had to become pretty good warriors in order to defend their wealth their cattle. And they did become good warriors, riding on these horses that they had used for herding their animals. They learned how to shoot a bow and arrow, a recurved bow, very accurately and defend their livestock. They not only defended their stuff, they became pretty aggressive at attacking other people. And out of these steps swept the Cimmeranians, the Scythians, the Sarmatians, and other great tribes of warriors who succeeded one another here in Ukraine. Along with this warrior ethos, they developed some interesting social characteristics. These warriors were very tough and they developed a warrior ethos of standing side by side in battle or fighting side by side and never giving up, never letting the enemy through. So if each man was willing to die rather than let an enemy through, it gave them a tremendous advantage in warfare. So they used this, used this advantage to expand their territory. Another thing came with this. When every man was willing to die, he had to depend on the others, and the others would not let him down. If he died, somebody else would take care of his children and his wife. And another thing, nobody would poach his wife while he was off fighting. They developed 
a very strong matrimonial bond. Women in this society had more respect, more responsibility, and were more productive than women elsewhere in other societies that were treated simply as possessions and breeding material. Another thing that came of this is that these warrior bonds, bands called Minnerbund, they used the German term for that, elected their own leaders. They did not depend on hereditary leadership so much, but they would elect their leaders as the best warriors. So they became quite egalitarian, which is another thing that characterizes us in the West. So these people were temperamentally different than others, and this temperamental difference led to other great inventions of Western civilization. We share knowledge. We have universities that share knowledge. The church shared knowledge. So we may not be any smarter by measured IQ than, say, the Japanese, Chinese, or the Jews, but we seem to accomplish more because we cooperate, because the inventions of one person are shared by everybody. So let me tell you three examples that Dukinzi uses in his book of how we are unique and why the people who say that we aren't unique were wrong. First, he talks about clocks. The detractors said, Westerners didn't invent clocks. The Chinese had a water clock centuries before the West had clocks. And this is true. The water clock worked kind of like an hourglass. It depended on how fast water flowed out of one vessel into another one. It measured time pretty accurately. But the Chinese water clocks were not widely spread. So where did the Western clock come from? It starts with Galileo. Galileo noticed that a pendulum kept very good time. The time that it took for a swing depended not on the weight of what was being of the bottom of the pendulum and not on the distance of the swing. It depended only on the length of the string that it was suspended from. Using this principle, Shortly after Galileo, somebody invented a clock. They tied an, escape, an escapement mechanism to it, and we had the clock. So the invention of the clock was Western, and the use of the clock was also Western. There was a need to tell time. And within a few decades of the invention of the clock, there were clocks all over Europe sitting on church steeples so that people would know when it was time for church and the bells rang telling them when it was time to fix dinner. So the invention of the clock and the sharing of the clock was unique. Another invention was printing. They say, well, the Chinese invented printing, and so they did. The Chinese would carve a wooden block, put it in ink, stamp on cloth, and they had patterns long before Gutenberg invented the press. So what was special about Gutenberg? Quite a bit, it turns out. Gutenberg put type in a tray, movable type, so you could change what you were printing. You could set it up to print each page of a book. This was new. Each letter was a separate block. So the frame to hold the blocks. That was new with Gutenberg. Gutenberg had better paper than the Chinese. This was just the luck of the draw. They had rice paper. We had other paper derived from Egyptian papyrus that simply took the ink better. So we were better in that regard. Another advantage Gutenberg had was the press. In the West, we'd been using presses for grapes and olives for a long time, and he simply adopted the press to printing. So you put that all together, and he had something that was quite unique. 
and it spread rapidly throughout Europe. This is the other thing. When the good idea came up, it spread rapidly. After Gutenberg invented the press about 1450, it spread throughout Europe because there was a thirst for printed material, a thirst for reading, and books expanded rapidly in the West. Dukenzi's third example is from navigation. Now, once again, the Chinese were there before us. The Chinese sent a huge fleet to the coast of Africa in the middle of the 15th century to impress the Africans with how great the Middle Kingdom was, and the Africans, I suppose, were duly impressed. And having impressed the Africans, the Chinese went home. They didn't need anything from Africa, and they stayed there. At the same time, Henry the Navigator, the Prince of Portugal, set up a navigation school in Sagres, southern Portugal, to advance the science of navigation for commercial purposes. Portugal was a small country, a million people on the edge of Europe, and navigation would help them expand. All right. So they learned how to sail their boats against the wind. Everybody could sail with the wind. Tacking against the wind was a bit of a trick. They improved rudders and keels so that the boats would go a little straighter and a little faster. And they improved the instruments such as the azimuth, their astrolabe, to figure out where they were going. And another big improvement, they shared their knowledge, particularly with maps. The Portuguese had went down the coast of Africa and they made maps as they went. So every succeeding voyager had the advantage of the knowledge that the previous guys had picked up. So these cartographers figured out what the world was like and they made, as accurate as they could, maps of where they were so that other navigators following them could repeat the success. This came into play particularly after Columbus discovered America. Only a decade or so after Columbus discovered America, there were maps of the American coast. There you may have heard the name of Americus Vespucci, you know, the guy after whom America is named. He made the maps. He, he was one guy that made maps of what they had discovered. Once again, this is the sharing of knowledge. So not only did we Westerners invent things, but we shared it because sharing was in our culture. Going back to these Indo-Europeans who didn't organize by family, but organized by collectives, and they shared knowledge. So this is the uniqueness of Western civilization. The sharing brought us to the top of the world. We, we Europeans dominated at one point or another, 80% of the land area of the world, although we're only 8%. Basically, everything except China, Japan, and the Ottoman Empire were at one point under our control. This is also our undoing, because we developed this egalitarian sense in our own societies of everybody looking out for everybody else, and we tend to be altruistic in treating everybody else as our equals and giving them respect, which doesn't work because they don't respect us. This is what Dickensian is fighting. They say, you didn't do that. They detract us, and we take them seriously when they say, you didn't do that. We need to learn to stand up for ourselves again, which we developed a habit of not doing because we were looking out for everybody else. So that's the uniqueness of Western civilization, and I owe Dickensy a book review. You can look for it before too long. Madam Toastmaster.